I just kind of wanted to start hearing a little bit more about you, um, how your Orphan Train project got started, what you guys do. Well, thank you. I'm trying to think. I think it was about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, I had a friend who lived in Missouri. He went to uh, a program about Orphan Train Complex. Uh, someone had you know, put on an hour evening program. And as soon as he got home, he called me because he knew that my family uh, was very deep in railroading. And he said, John, you need to find out about orphan trains. And I said, Jim, what are orphan trains? <laughs> so that's where the conversation got started. So I started looking into it. Um, talk to your predecessor on the phone. Uh, I, I am a retired lawyer. And so I always look for projects to do. Uh, and I, I write a lot about railroads. Um, so this stimulated my interest because I was very unfamiliar with it. Um, and it became more and more interesting because as I talked to people in the orphan train world, for lack of a better phrase, uh, it became obvious that they knew very little about railroading and trains. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of people were making lots of assumptions about how trains operated, et cetera. In fact, the mantra back then was, uh, there were special or training loads of orphans that crisscrossed the country, dropping people off here and there. And that's still pr very prevalent. People yeah. assume that, uh, that they inquire or query us about, you know, did was there an orphan train that stopped such and such a place and such and such a day? And uh, I am affiliated with the Upper Muscle Shell Historic Society, which is uh, in a little town in the middle of Montana, Harleton, where my mother is from. And that's where all my family worked on the Milwaukee Railroad. So we uh, decided that we would try to insert some railroading reality into the orphan train world. Um, we gathered together about 65,000 pages of railroad timetables and wow. railway guides. Uh, once I figured out that, in fact, all of these children rode on regularly scheduled passenger trains, ships, um, and riverboats, never was there a special orphan train. Right. Um, and so our, our uh, mantra has been um, educating the world as to that fact. Mm -hmm. And... Then we decided that, again, this is about a year and a half later, I uh, was at an orphan train conference in um, uh, Minnesota, and there were, I don't know, a good 150 people there. So I got a chance to really visit with people about what they, what they would like to know about their descendants. Mm -hmm. And one of them is, how did they get to where they grew up? Right, we get a lot of questions to that effect here at the museum. Right, right. and so we were able to, through the assembly of this database, um, from 18, well, I want to say, well, from the very beginning, actually, through the end, we can plot the individual trip of any orphan train rider over the 70 or 80 years, that, or 90 years, I guess, that, that occurred. Um, so that became our significant project. Um, and we still do that today. Um, and so, you know, it's evolved like anything else today. If someone uh, sends me an email that says, I want to know when my grandfather or how he got from, from um, New York City to Tudot, Montana, or Oshkosh, Wisconsin, or wherever in the country on uh, in January of 1903, we can plot his grandfather's trip. And so we do that in great detail. We, we like to include between eight to 12 photographs that are relevant to his trip. Um, and it's very, very rewarding. Of course, we don't charge anything for our work because we're a bunch of old fat gray guys. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it's, it is great fun. We also, um, do consulting for film, television. Um, and in the last 
three months, a streak of, of, of uh, novelists, it seems. Um, and of course, Kelly, uh, we don't have a website. The only place people could find us is through you. Right, yeah. And we are happy to have you listed on our website because I have seen your work and it is fantastic. Like it, it blows my mind that you are able to trace these kids exact journey that they took as orphan train writers. It's just, it's just amazing <laughs> to see what you guys can do. I never thought that we could get that specific. Um, yeah, and it, 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 you know, it's interesting. Uh, for example, we use what are called the official railway guides, which are published every six months from the beginning to just a year ago. Now they're not published, they're digital, but it still exists. They list every single passenger train for the January of 1906 that ran in North America, United wow. States, Canada, and Mexico. So there are, I think there are two significant reasons why we're able to do this with very, I would say on average in 97, 98% accuracy. The first one was, and you know, again, thank goodness, um, the idea was to send these children to small towns, mm -hmm. not to cities. Well, small towns in America, uh, even in the heyday of railroad, again, one train in and one train out. So that set the arrival time and place of that child. Right. We, we also know that the, for example, the New York Central uh, Railroad and the uh, New York Foundling Hospital for decades had a very close relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, Children's uh, Aid Society and the Erie Railroad, same thing. And then you start to interplay um, how railroads worked with each other. Mm -hmm. So we know that the New York Central and the Milwaukee Road had a very close working relationship for 90 years. Um, so if a child left New York on a Tuesday morning on the New York Central from, from the New York Foundling Home, uh, arrived in, um, oh gosh, uh, uh, Lemon, South Dakota, Two days later, the only way they could have gotten there was to change to the Milwaukee Road in Chicago. Really? And lo, lo and behold, there it is. <laughs> it's just, that is amazing. Uh, yeah, that, that what a great resource, those railroad guides. I, I bet most people don't even know that those exist. I didn't know until just now <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that those sort of railroad guides even existed. So that's, that is fascinating. Yep, and it, it, it's it's great fun, and of course we've got it down fairly pat. And it's really mm -hmm. interesting because every now and then we'll get a real challenge, and then we have to put on our working hat. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's cool. It's it's great fun, and uh, like I say, it's very rewarding. I there's a small town north of you in Kansas. I can't remember the name of it. It's right on the the uh, the border, and I it was probably wasn't that like the first year that we were doing this and this set the tone i think for what we do today so there was a gal who called me because in those days we I, I, we accepted phone calls and mm -hmm. uh, we only work through the written word now because okay. uh, and i guess a caveat there the reason we only work with the written word is because the data that we use in terms of the child inevitably arises out of um either the children's aid society um the New York Foundling Hospital, the Home for Little Wanderers, um, but it's private data. Mm -hmm. And so we want to keep a record of what we do with that. Right. Um, New York state law is particularly fussy about these kinds of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, we don't do phone work anymore, but back then we did. The gal called me and she said, my father was 92 years old was an orphan train writer. He's never known how he got to, again, I can't remember the small town. Can you help us? We said, sure. <laughs> so we put together his itinerary, sent it to him. And about a week later, she called me back. And by the time it was done, she was in tears. Her dad was in tears. I was in tears. Because it really filled a hole in his life yeah. that he never knew. And so that's what happens. And it's 
it, it happens over and over and over. And it's, it's just, it's very, very rewarding work. I agree. I mean, <laughs> I think those moments are some of the, the most special moments, like the best part about this job. Yep. Is, yeah, getting pe- getting to help people fill in those gaps, those question marks that they've had for years and years and years. And sometimes for like multiple generations, yep. people have had these same questions of how did grandpa get here or, you know, who who were his birth parents or um, those sorts of questions. And yeah, being able to help fill in those those gaps and answer those questions is yep. so amazing. <laughs> it's great to know a little bit more about what you do and how how you go about it. Yeah, Um, that's definitely helpful for us here.